Boom! What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakian. Very excited to be talking about AI and education. We have Brian Talaby joining us on the show. Hello. Hello. How are you? Thank you so much for coming on. Very pumped for this episode. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. For those who don't know Brian's background, he started his career at age 16 working for NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and is now founder and CEO of Ahura AI which invented a technology that enables people to learn three to five times faster than traditional education. You can find the links in the bio below to ohuraai.com as well as the LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram profiles and heroglass.org. All right, Brian, let's start things off by asking you about who are you? Tell us about your journey. Yeah, absolutely. So I had a pretty fascinating one. I was born in a tiny village with no running water and no electricity out in the southeastern desert of Iran, a tiny village called Zanjirun. Um, my father was part of a tribe of nomadic Turks called the Qashqai, brilliant people, the friendliest people in the world. Um, and so he was one of the first people in his tribe to go to university. Um, and he came back and ran a school that uh, under a black tent went around nomadically across the desert with the tribe and trained uh, the next generation of youth from the Qashqai tribe. So fast forward a number of years, I was born, um, and unfortunately we had to, well fortunately and unfortunately, we had to flee persecution um, in Iran during the time of the Ayatollah. And so we escaped across the border into Turkey, where we lived in abject poverty for two years um, while we were waiting for political asylum here in the United States. And what the reason I said fortunately before is that even though it was very difficult, um, I made, once we moved to Maryland, we had access to one of the best educational systems in the world. Um, and so that was a fascinating experience. I didn't really understand the culture of the language, so I dove into science and math, taught myself quantum mechanics and differential equations from a pretty young age, wrote a couple of white papers, and eventually got invited to come to NASA at Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland to begin working there when I was 16. So that was a wild experience. I felt like I was a kid in a candy store every day. I would go in and take what's called an air shower. So I worked in the clean room. And so for a uh, majority of the time I was there. And so uh, it was fascinating because you go in, you take a, uh, it's like basically a shower except it shoots high pressure air at you. So you take a, an air shower to take off all the dust particles um, from your body. You get into what we affectionately call the bunny suit, which is essentially a big white plastic suit with um, transparent uh, part over your face. And so you take a second air shower to just in case any particulates got from your clothes to the outside of the bunny suit. So we go into the clean room, and if you don't know what a clean room is, it's fascinating. It's this room the size of several football fields. And on one side, they have a series of fans of all sizes that shoot air across the room. And on the other side, they have air a tunnel. massive vacuum. Air tunnel? No? Kind of. Okay. Um, air tunnels You're, are a little bit different. Okay. This is a clean okay. room. And so this what, is a clean room? This is a clean room. And it's a football field? Yeah. Well, that's where they put together a lot of the satellites, the shuttles, and things like that. So it's... It's pretty big. And so on the opposite side, they have these vacuums that siphon the air. So there's always this kind of wind coming through. And the air gets cycled through a series of uh, filters that clean the air to, I think if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, I might be off by an order of magnitude or so, but I think one part per million particles. Because if you have a dust particle on a lens or on a mirror that goes into space, well, that ruins any of the data that you collect, it corrupts it. So One dust particle can ruin data that you're collecting from that's space. Absolutely right, yeah. Because, I mean, just the amount of, um, of light, the amount of data that you're collecting from you know, thousands of light years away is it just constantly going through the, the, the lens or the, uh, the mirror, depending on what kind. So we worked on the Constellation X project, and so we we're looking at the... Um, uh, the uh, emanations from the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. So you need to have lenses of very large proportions. Um, and then we realized that if you use parallax, you can point a bunch of satellites at that point and it Damn. magnifies the image tremendously. So it was pretty fascinating. What a crazy upbringing for you and your family. Well, yeah. And, the, but fortunate, fortunate, but also unfortunate. Yeah, that 
that you had to leave. There's also a um, just more and more. I think we're gonna end up getting to, towards this um, at the end, but there's got to be a stronger harmony and coherence with nature and with each other on this planet moving forward because it, we get we got to we got to get over the self-dealing and the corruption and the um the hatred and the war these are these things are obsoleting and we got to push in that direction so well you're absolutely right i agree completely and it's um obviously causes a lot of pain and suffering for a lot of people and beyond that it's also very inefficient right i mean it's uh, all this wasted effort wasted resources wasted yeah. um, time wasted mental energy that can be used for much more productive things for moving human society forward lack of yeah r waste of human potential this type of stuff and you yeah. know this became really clear to me when i had an opportunity to go back and visit iran when did you um, go back Oh, it was uh, after I um, had a chance to work at NASA and uh, sold my first company and got a chance to go back and visit Zanjirun, the village where I was born. And it was a wild experience because I got a chance to sit down with a lot of the kids that I used to play with when I was four. And now, of course, we're adults. And um, they're, they're amazing people. They're just so, uh, so much heart. And it was so much fun seeing everybody. And after so many years... But it also was a weird experience because many of the people I sat down with were illiterate. And there were sheep herders and goat herders. And uh, a number of them spent three hours trying to convince me that the Earth is in the center of the universe. And so that was like a visceral punch in the gut for me. Because I have the same background as all these guys. You know, we have the same genetic code, and yet our lives were so radically different. And I couldn't help but think, what would have happened if we didn't have to flee persecution. If we wound up staying, um, what would my life have looked like at that point? Yeah, and the amount of uh, these like life-changing moments that um, put people into trajectories where they do things like end up going and working at NASA instead of being literate. Um, these are crazy that they happen around the world. We've had <laughs> multiple guests on the show that have made it very clear that these pivotal moments have helped turn them into who they are today. Um, and there is some interesting things about the philosophies, potentially, of people that are just on the land also, that are just with animals that much. So it's like your worldview, yes, got augmented in so many ways, and, um, and, but there still has some interesting aspects to it that we could still even learn from. Yeah, but it's, it's, there's a little, some... No, we were talking yeah. about that earlier, absolutely. I mean, there's um, so much separation that we see in... The Western world, and as much as I love everything we create, all the science, all the technology, we're moving uh, the human species forward, and yet there's something we lose where uh, for most of human history, for most of the 100,000 years, we had these tribes around us, we had these extended families, we had this constantly working with the soil, being out in the sun, being part of nature um, that enable us to be much happier and be able to live much more fulfilling lives. And so we see this resurgence or this massive spike rather in anxiety and depression and suicidal tendencies, especially amongst young people, but generally across the population and especially in the Western world. And a lot of people don't really know where that comes from. Uh, but when you have the society structured in a way where you don't really have these close relationships anymore. And so many of our relationships, and I hate to uh, be harping on something a lot of other people talk about, but uh, when so many of our relationships are on Facebook and Instagram, and when uh, we spend most of our time indoors, don't get that vitamin D, don't have our hands in, in the soil, don't have that interaction with people as, as we used to, I mean, the, there's a, that impacts us in different ways. Yeah, yeah, and the resurgence of, of, of nature back into our uh, essence on a daily basis is now becoming more and more evidently important. Um, all right, let's do this. You um, were giving us the, uh, the bit on NASA, and then you ended up also saying that uh, you sold your first company. And then how did all of the next years trickle into your fascination with the fourth industrial revolution? Sure. Well, so let me go back a little bit. So um, <laughs> when I was 17, I was selected to uh, do this presentation to the deputy White House science advisor at NASA. And it was funny because uh, I got on stage and um, I stuttered my way through an hour-long presentation. Um, by the time I got off stage, my clothes were 
soaked head to foot. It looked like I just jumped in a pool. There's a pool under me, a puddle rather, of just my sweat dripping off over the hour presentation. And I walked off and my mentor at the time said, Brian, that was the worst presentation I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Which was true, it was absurdly bad. But I realized at that point that my dream at that point was to either become the administrator of NASA or to run a company with 40,000 engineers. Um, and ultimately to have an impact on the world. I had read quite a bit when I was in middle school a lot of Stephen Hawking. He always talked about how if we don't learn how to colonize other planets within 100 years, we're going to go extinct as a human race. I thought there's a number of problems that I wanted to solve, and I'd be able to do that uh, at the head of a large company. But after having that experience, I realized that potentially I don't have the skill sets necessary to do that. So I, I cataloged all the skill sets I thought I would need in order to become that person and everything from being able to speak in public, being able to persuasively share my ideas, being articulate, being able to recruit people, uh, be able to uh, lead organizations. And then I did an objective catalog of my own skill sets and I found myself completely lacking. And so at that point, I had a choice to make. Do I reduce my goals fairly substantially or do I increase my skill sets? And um, I had read the studies about the 10,000 hour rule. My father is a brilliant man. He was a psychology professor. I, I used to enjoy taking his textbooks and reading them uh, even when I was a kid. And so I had read about these studies and so I went after the, the original research that was done. And so this is way before Malcolm Gladwell popularized this idea. And uh, I realized, hey, this is something I can actually learn. Um, the 10,000 hours, I just have to put in that kind of practice. And so in college, after working at the Space Systems Labs for, uh, for a couple of years, I decided to start a company under the auspices of an organization called the Southwestern Company, which is a 150-year-old company based out of Nashville, Tennessee, where they teach college students to run their own businesses during the summertime. Mm -hmm. And so I created a company selling educational products to families in their homes. Um, eventually I had 72 people under me and we did a million dollars in annual recurring revenue and all that stuff. But it was funny because when I first started, you know, and you're Armenian, so you understand the, the Middle Eastern mindset, the way my, I was raised uh, as a Persian, you, there's a definite hierarchy of things that you can do in life. And so doctor, engineer, lawyer, then a whole bunch of other things then trash man, and then underneath that is selling books. Yeah. <laughs> and so even though I was running this company, I was in charge of, of course, the sales and marketing, but also you know, the PR and the accounting and the logistics and all the different elements. Um, I remember conversations with my family and they were just like, what are you doing? You left NASA to sell things to people? But at the end of the day, what was fascinating is I had a chance to sit down with 30,000 families in their living rooms to talk to them yeah. about their education for their children, their hopes and dreams, the challenges they face in Texas, in Oklahoma, Ohio, Wisconsin, Mississippi, Missouri, all over the place. And one of the things I found is that this inequality to access to education and opportunity exists within the United States as well, and of course more globally. Um, and I realized that um, there is a massive misalignment um, in terms of how education is consumed and how it's provided. What was um, the software providing for the It wasn't there? software, there were educational books. It was physical books. It was physical and books that helped was, with homework. Oh, that helped with homework, okay. Yeah. And for like middle high school? Is yeah, it elementary school, middle school, high school. Right. It turns out that most parents can't actually help their kids with homework uh, because math was taught in a different way when they were in school. Um, you know, 20, 30 years have passed since they were studied algebra and the quadratic equation. So parents really struggle to be able to help their kids with homework. And so we would go in and provide them the resources they needed to be able to do well and go to college and so forth. Okay. And so, so I stopped doing that. I built a consulting company um, after seven years of building this organization. Uh, oh, seven years for building the educational yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, then I built a, a consulting company where I would go into small to mid-sized businesses in, uh, in Western North Carolina, where I lived at the time, uh, and I would help them massively increase their revenue. I would transform the way they managed their sales teams and their organizations and so forth. And after I sold that is when I really started looking at how can I change the world. And so I worked at ZocDoc for a while. Um, I was part of the team that um, took ZocDoc. I was a manager, but was helping kind of revamp their entire sales process to a sales 3.0 model. 
they got to unicorn status. I then took that transition and was the head of sales VP of sales at a series of tech companies that wound up having exits or became profitable. And so um, at that point, I realized um, uh, the last company I was working with, it was, it was a company that used AI to automate and personalize marketing messages. And I realized there's so much more that you can do with artificial intelligence rather than just use it for marketing and to make really well. I really think a college degree is the best way to measure how many educated people we have, but it's a, it's a relatively good stand-in. If we can 10x that number, that's 10x the number of engineers and doctors and medical professionals and philosophers and scientists and researchers. We can solve a lot more of the problems that we're facing with education, but the challenge is that education really hasn't changed in the past 500 years, right? If you look at transportation 500 years ago to now, it's radically different. If you look at the way we consume media from 500 years ago to now, it's radically different. The way we live is radically different. Even the clothes we wear is radically different, but if you look at education, it's still a classroom with a teacher in front of the class teaching with a one-size-fits-all approach to 30 students. Now we've added iPads into the classrooms and smart boards instead of chalkboards, but fundamentally it hasn't really shifted. And it's still this, um, uh, this old system that eventually was designed to train uh, factory workers, right? which is why we have this over-reliance on bells and responding to authority and so forth. And that just doesn't work for the current world, because right now, and to, this is a very long way of answering the question that you asked, right now we're at the precipice of what I think is a slow-moving train wreck. We're in, well into the fourth industrial revolution. Now, the first three, we, they were fantastic. It worked really well for us. We had several generations for people to be retrained for the jobs that they needed to get into, right? And uh, when the farmers were terrified, hey, what happens when all the jobs go away? Uh, they were able to, over several generations, train their kids and their kids' kids to then start learning the skill sets necessary for other jobs. The challenge now, and the reason I think it's something we need to solve um, immediately, is that over the next five to ten years, Alan, we're going to lose somewhere around 49 million jobs here in the United States, around 800 million to 2 billion jobs globally, depending on who you listen to, whether it's McKinsey or PwC or Gartner. Um, and so we're in a situation where 38% of the jobs that exist are going to be replaced by automation and artificial intelligence. Everything from truck drivers, right, to Uber drivers and taxi drivers, to retail employees, to fast food workers, um, to uh, phone call operators, phone center operators. Uh, there's a number of jobs. And then there's the jobs that rely on these industries that we're talking about. So even, so, Retail, for example, there's different forms of retail. There's the Amazon retail stores that are replacing the workers that they need, right? There's McDonald's that's replacing all of their cashiers with kiosks by 2020. But then if you think about just the trucking, there's 3.5 million truckers in the United States. There are all sorts of towns that have sprung up that provide gasoline and food and services and so forth to truckers as they make their journeys across the country. What happens when suddenly those people don't need any of the services anymore. And so all the cars and all the trucks are self-driving and they don't need to stop anymore. Suddenly you have all these communities around the United States whose means of livelihood immediately go away. What happens to those communities? Do they have to immediately move to the big cities, um, pull the kids out of school, rip apart the social fabric of those communities? What happens to all the they move uh, to the metropolises where there's job opportunities, retraining, <laughs> where there's, in Manhattan, there's barely any trees outside of Central Park, <laughs> disconnection from nature, right. further programming with 5G and all this other kind of stuff. Yeah, potentially. Could be the big, could be the, one of the big things. How do you um, help the people that are in that part of the world that are going through that process and what is the future of educating and helping them? Well, the good news is there is a solution. Right, because um, there's a number of jobs that you can do remotely where you can actually maintain the cohesion within those communities where people can retrain for the jobs of the future. The challenge is that the cohorts of people we're talking about with that first level of job displacement are the folks who didn't go to college, they barely made it through high school, they haven't really upskilled at all uh, since they left high school, they have a favorite bar they go to, a dog, a cat, 
two kids, and a white picket fence, right? And so the traditional forms of educating these people has already failed in the past, so there's no reason to believe that it's going to be successful the second time around. And so you need a different approach. Now, everything we interact with in our daily lives is now personalized to us, right? Whether it's our Facebook feeds, our Amazon recommendation engine, or the shows we watch on Netflix, everything is custom to us, even our suits, right? And yet education is still a one-size-fits-all approach. Even MOOCs, massive online open courseware, which was supposed to solve this problem of scale, is still a one-size-fits-all approach that just doesn't work for most people. It works for a certain subset of the population that learns in that particular way. But it turns out, and we talked about the Bloom study earlier, there's a, a study from 1984 that shows that when you compare people who learn through a private tutor or a private instructor one-on-one, 90% -on -one, of those students score in the top 20th percentile when you compare them against the entire population of students. I mean, first of all, mathematically, that doesn't make sense. How can 90% score in the top 20th percentile? Well, it's a, a group that is now a subset of a much larger group. And what that tells me is, you know, if you take out the bottom 10%, right? So the delta is that 70% of the population that could be scoring much higher, but isn't. And so my response to that is, well, it's not those students that are failing, it's that the education system is failing to deliver that content to them in a way that's optimized for them to be able to understand. Yeah, around the world and filling the time of the fourth industrial revolution when we need the, the education to be spread wide and yeah in, in in ways that are relatable for every single one of the um, young people so then yeah so let's talk about that so how does how do we scale like a one-on-one -on -one mentorship uh, that gets people trained on fourth uh, industrial revolution well that's exactly why I dedicated my life to building a hurrah um, so that's a question we ask, how do we solve this problem? And so for, uh, after I left my position as executive making a ton of money uh, and saying, hey, I'm going to just put my, my money behind this, I'm going to put my life behind this, and I'm going to go for it, the first three months all we did is research to say, okay, what is all the evidence out there? Where are all the studies, uh, all the PhDs? And I have several of them on my uh, advisory board. But how can we use artificial intelligence to solve this problem? And it turns out that the optimal way for, let's say, Alan to learn something is actually different at 8 a.m. versus 8 p.m. This idea that uh, there's visual learners or auditory learners, or kinesthetic learners, and that's just the primary way you learn is actually completely bunk because you're not one thing, depending on how much sleep you have, your nutrition, your activity level, and even if you just had a fight with one of your friends or your significant other or what have you, those all impact the optimal way that you can actually absorb information. Yeah. So then the question was, how do we figure out uh, what is your particular mindset in that moment? Now, there's a lot of different ways you can do it, right? There's a ton of sensors out there. You could do EEG machines that you wear that are fairly expensive. There's uh, the number of sensors over the past couple of years have proliferated. I mean, it's just exploded exponentially. But then the problem is, if you're talking about Joe Schmo, who's a 49-year-old trucker out in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, well, is he going to have access to all this expensive technology? So we thought, okay, what is the technology that everybody has access to? And what are the sensors that we can use? And what are the data points that we can extract from those sensors? So we decided everybody has a laptop in this day and age. You can buy a fairly advanced one for 200 bucks. And every laptop has a fairly good camera and a fairly good microphone. And so we delved into what are all the biometric markers that we can capture. And it turns out that you can actually catch and recapture about 10,000 biometric data points every second on an individual while they're on our platform studying. Now, of course, it brings up a lot of privacy concerns. We're adamant that we're not going to use any of this data outside of education. And no human being looks at any of the data. Only the AI does and only to enable people to learn faster. But putting that aside for the second, and of course, like massive levels like of encryption and security. But like things like the front-facing camera sees like my eye movement and it's like I'm distracted instead of focused. That's absolutely right. So it captures everything from your eye tracking to your facial expressions and micro expressions as well as something we call a fidget score. So how much you move around while you're looking or studying. Um, right now we're also focusing on finding ways to capture pupil dilation and facial flushing 
from the existing cameras. Um, there's a number of different ways to do that. We turn on the microphone as well. So from voice commands and from uh, the various interactions, we capture sentiment analysis, how you feel and how you're acting based on your tone of voice. Mm -hmm. We use speech to text and natural language processing to understand the specific word usage as well as ambient noise. We also capture you know, other pages that you go to. Um, we're also working on adding wearables uh, for everybody that read the Mary Miku report, you know that the number of wearables in the United States has doubled over the past year. It's going to continue exponentially increasing. And so even though the, it's not as proliferated as we'd like, uh, eventually it's going to get there. And so uh, we can capture heart rate, stress rate, um, activity level, sleep patterns from either wearables or from Apple Watch or Fitbits or you know the Aura Ring and other things as well. And so from that massive data set, we can understand in real time how to share the right content to the right person in the right format at the right time. And we can switch dynamically between forms of content at the appropriate time to in increase engagement, to increase outcomes, uh, and enable people to learn much more effectively. So if I'm doing something like coding or designing or architecting or whatever it is, that then I am also uh, having my not only wearable data, but also camera data, microphone data, all these things be processed. So I, I do have to then um, uh, enable Ahura while I'm using like um, a, another software suite like if I'm editing video in Premiere I just enable Ahura and then it watches me as I as I do Premiere yeah like yeah stuff that's like exactly that. right it's actually okay. a very easy plugin that you can enable at any point or um, you can have it be automatic as well and add it to an LMS system a learning management system um, or a part of the our LMS that we've built as well uh, you for the people LMS. that yeah um, yeah Okay. Okay. So when I'm when I'm um, going through a process of yeah learning across one of the many platforms or your platform that um, or even just working mm -hmm. that then I can turn it on and and then it the um, there's also a process of seeing my level of interest in the material that I'm learning and then tailoring me uh, the difficulty of the material towards my cognitive capabilities in yeah. the moment because I might be sleep deprived or I might not have eaten or whatever, all these variables we were talking about earlier. Absolutely. So it's adaptive learning in every sense of the world, both in terms of the difficulty level, but a, a bigger component of that, because that's been done. Um, we added it. Um, that's not that new. A lot of adaptive learning from a perspective of questions, harder and easier questions on the standardized tests as well as uh, relaxing the level of difficulty, that's something that is useful. What we think is even more useful is having a catalog of uh, dozens of different formats to teach the exact same thing that you're learning. So not only being able to switch from, let's say, text-based or experiential or video, but even within, let's say, video. So um, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're trying to listen to someone speak, but because of visual noise or whether it's the tempo of their voice or the particular stories they tell or their accent, it causes distractions. When you focus more on those mm. verbal tics maybe than mm. the content. And so there's ways to also switch the video to make it easier to uh, download that information. Mm. Now what's really fascinating is uh, there's two things that I was blown away by. It's slightly creepy if it's used the wrong way, and so I'm super focused on not creating a dystopian future <laughs> in the wrong way, but uh, we can now, at Ahura, with a 60% confidence interval, predict 10 seconds before someone pulls out their phone mm -hmm. and goes on Facebook or Instagram because they really need that dopamine hit. We can now predict that they're going to do that 10 seconds beforehand. So then, now we're working on how do you increase that confidence interval and how do you build in interventions because you and I both know that context switching costs are extremely high every time you stop doing what you're doing and get out of that flow state and go on Facebook and look at how many comments or likes the post has by the time you get back to work not only have you lost that time but it takes 25 to 45 minutes for you to be in that flow state again with your neurons all firing in the same way to be able to carry on and so um, that's a massive time savings. Huge, yeah. That, yeah. That I'm so interested in in um, interventions for um, keeping people in flow states. That's a really, really big one. Um, we 
a lot of times we think we're in control of our you know food habits but our gut microbiome has so much to do with it we think we're in control of our technology but really those notifications in many ways are in control or what shows up in the news feed these types of things so to be able to really um, take um, full control of our um, attention and our education so let's talk about spreading this um, around the world so um, mm -hmm. one of the another SDG 4 education SDG 10 inequality yep, that's the second big one that we're focused on because I mean I think I'm a perfect example of this when you provide access to educational resources it enables people to be able to pull themselves up uh, it enables people to have radically different lives and um, if you have access to the same educational content in a village in Namibia, as you would if you're living in New York, suddenly those people don't need to leave. You can get all the education that you need and then stay and provide resources and provide your mental talents to that community. Because the thing I always think about is what would have happened if Einstein was born in a Syrian refugee camp and wasn't able to leave, right? What if Marie Curie was born in a tiny village in Thailand and never had an opportunity to leave and, you know, was a rice farmer or something else? And so it's... Um, I wonder how many brilliant people whose capabilities we're not using around the world. And so inequality, I think, is a function of that, of having access. And so at Ahura, what we do is um, for every seat that we sell to corporations and to universities, we provide a free seat to members of underserved communities. And we do this in collaboration with NGOs and refugee camps and others to make sure we're providing those resources in the right places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th those models are are a huge part of our future. Yeah, being able to give and, and the mission aligned companies uh, end up also um, attracting um, better talent and attract um, more people uh, on to onboard them for the project. That's good. Okay, so um, so then people from around the world are able to get a free seat as mm -hmm. well for her. Okay, um, and then what is the uh, is the LMS currently? Um, ha you have like a decent amount of like modules for people to to become educated in as well. Or yeah, okay. so what, we're launching the beta version um, okay. in about four to five months. We have yeah. an alpha version that's live. We have a bunch of people on it. Um, with the beta version, yeah, we'll have a uh, five different set of courses. Um, we already have most of the content for that from a whole bunch of different sources that we have partnerships with. Uh, it's like a Spotify type model, which is kind of cool. Um, but so they're social media management, coding with Java and Python, um, therapy, and finance. And I use the coding as two of them because those are two different sets of classes. So when we decided on which courses we would start off with, I wanted to make sure that number one, they're jobs that they could do from anywhere. You could do remote work. Number two, that um, having a college degree in that area wasn't really needed. And that employers don't really care about whether you have a college degree, they care more about you actually being able to perform the work and know the content. And number three, then being areas where there's a massive uh, misalignment between supply and demand. So there's a lot more demand for those jobs than there is supply. So if we use social media as an example, every massive corporation needs an army of social media managers that uh, create their social media strategy and execute on it. And yet, um, there aren't enough people that are capable in doing that. And so, you see that. I've had so many conversations with presidents of universities that have told me, hey, Brian, we have, we put our instructional designers and have them spend two years, build out an entire curriculum on how to become a social media manager so we can teach college students. But by the time that course is ready to roll out, it's completely and utterly obsolete, right? And so most of the social media managers now are fairly self-taught through, you know, through practice and so forth. Um, but what winds up happening, I have so many friends that are global citizens and digital nomads or do the van life thing, right? And travel around in a van, spend several hours a day running social media for these massive corporations. And the fact that corporations are in such a poor bargaining position where they have to accept that these people are just not gonna come into the office and they'll probably put in a couple hours a day and they don't really have that much oversight, it's because those are the only people that know how to do the work. There aren't enough people for them to have a good negotiating position. There's this massive supply demand misalignment and we can train people to do that, that's fantastic because going back to that you know, trucker or a you know, coal miner or uh, a person doing retail for the past 20 years, this is something that they can very easily learn if it's taught to them the right way, 
And instead of having to take their kids out of school and rip apart the social fabric, they can do that job right from home. They don't have to move to New York with yeah. a lack of trees. Yeah, yeah. This is the huge uh, upswing in new jobs that are also created um, and also potentially jobs that um, people can uh, stay in their local communities and continue doing and learn from. Yeah, all of the, all of the fields that we were talking about earlier, it's just it's going to be a challenge to see how to fit um, people that are losing jobs that they currently know how to do in their later years of their life when they don't have as much neuroplasticity to do things like pick up how to learn AR, VR, learn how to do IoT stuff, blockchain stuff. It's much harder, but it, it is, it's, it's possible. I mean, yeah, social media management's, I think, easier than Unity programming, right? These types of things. Sure. Maybe. I don't know. Well, I'm not talking stuff. about teaching these guys how to do what my friend calls rocket surgery, right? Um, we don't need to teach them how to be blockchain programmers. That's fairly hard even for most programmers. But let me give you an ex another example. So there's this massive change that's happening in our society where there's these spikes in anxiety and depression and suicidal tendencies, not only amongst young people, but across the population more generally. And so there's these new apps that are rising, I'm sure you've heard of them, uh, where are basically Uber for therapy. Because it turns out that most of the middle class and lower class don't have 300 to $400 an hour to put aside for therapists that have PhDs and master's degrees. And so they wind up just not going because it's a matter of, do I put my kid in this therapy for $300 an hour and not pay rent? Or do I pay rent? And that's a fairly easy answer for most, most people. So what's turning up is these Uber-like apps where people can pay a complete stranger 25 to $50 an hour to listen to their problems. And they know that this person doesn't know any of their people. They're not going to talk to their friends and tell them their secrets. And they have a basic level of training where they can ask the right questions and provide a listening ear. Uh, just like we have suicide hotlines, right? There's the people on the other end of the suicide hotline don't have master's degree in therapy or a PhD in psychotherapy. On-demand massages will be an interesting one. Yeah, That's exactly right. So you can train people on these kind of skill sets and enable them to do meaningful work that they connect with. Um, and it doesn't have to be blockchain or data science or training people to become AI programmers. Some of these things are more complicated and are a lot more difficult once that neuroplasticity starts to go away in later years. Um, and so that's definitely something that we've been thinking about for sure. And then how about, um, you know, this is making a lot of sense um, with um, uh, artificial intelligence and education. I think it's um, yeah, like you said, probably, um, I think education and poverty are the two big ones that if you um, can, if we can really target those and figure them out, all the other ones can more easily get tackled um, and solved by a lot of other of the young um, people around the world. But then where does this lead to all these new fourth industrial revolution technologies being birthed into the world? Um, a lot of people are really concerned about some of the um, biotech, neurotech being unleashed for just people that have um, financial resources that can afford them. Um, other people say, don't worry, don't worry, it'll be democratized over time, everyone will get access to it. So where do you stand on the um, inequality with the fourth industrial revolution? That's uh, something I'm definitely very concerned about uh, because look, the, the work that's being done right now on um, both genetic uh, modification with CRISPR and other technologies um, as well as biohacking, as well as um, uh, brain computer interfaces, and whether it's uh, uh, non invasive neural modulation or invasive with actual computer chips, there's a lot of opportunity for people that have the resources or have the inclination because some people just aren't willing to do that kind of. Um, uh, change for themselves. There, there's a potential for misuse, right? There's a potential that a certain subset of the population engages in this kind of activity and gets a an insurmountable advantage over another segment of the population, whether it's in terms of intelligence or um, cognitive ability or memory or uh, even physical strength. Uh, there's people right now um, that are adding compasses into their biology uh, and connecting it, and, and this is stuff that you can do fairly easily if you look it up. I mean, anybody can go do it now. Um, and so that's just obviously the first step, but what happens when you have a segment of the population that does this and then is later threatened by the rest of the population that's decided that's not natural, right? Now, I wanna take a step back for a second because there's um, some other issues that are coming into play, right? Because we've been talking about the truck drivers and retail employees that are gonna lose their jobs. The, um, the repetitive 
manual labor that's going to be replaced. What a lot of people don't realize, and I, I talk to a lot of very intelligent, very educated people that say, oh, that could never happen to me. I'm an accountant, or I'm a lawyer, or I'm a programmer. And it turns out that these repetitive cognitive tasks will also be replaced. It just won't be in the next five to 10 years. It'll be 10 to 20 years down the road, where radiology, there's already a ton of research that's happening. There's some com companies that are doing this where uh, AI can do radiology better than human doctors. Um, many accountants, many lawyers, many programmers will also be replaced down the road. And so you're talking about a wholesale change in the way that society functions, number one. Number two, we have this societal construct that you and I, and probably most of our viewers were raised in, which you go to school for either 12 or 16 or 20 or more years, depending on what you choose to do. Then in a linear progression, you work for 30 or 40 years, and then you retire. That's the world that we were given. That's what we've done for a pretty long time. And what we're seeing now is that's changing. Because of the rapid pace at which entire industries are rising and then dying, the rapid pace of the, for the need for rapidly upskilling and reskilling for future. Uh, what you're seeing is that the future is going to look quite different, where instead of having this linear progression, we're going to have a need for lifelong learning to continually upskill and reskill, lifelong work, potentially in multiple jobs simultaneously, what people call a portfolio career, and lifelong leisure. So instead of waiting for retirement, plugging that in for healthy lifestyles and having a balanced, uh, balanced life. And so that's a fundamentally different way of living than we have done in the past. And so we're going to have to address that, right? And hopefully giving everyone that ability to do the lifelong learning and lifelong leisure and lifelong work, doing things that they love, uh, doing things that are part of the fourth industrial revolution or being able to connect to nature more along the journey. And how do we do that? How do we ensure that every human is able to pursue their North Star with great vigor? Well, at the end of the day, I think it comes down to education, which is why I've dedicated my life to it. Um, I think it comes down to having, for example, an AI that follows you throughout your whole life and knows you better than you know yourself. But instead of using that AI to sell you things that you don't need or uh, spend more time flicking through an endless um, uh, news feed, uh, having that AI be able to understand in any given time how to teach you. Uh, so that down the road, in addition to learning how to be a social media manager, for example, when you buy a dog and you want to learn how to house train it, you can immediately say, okay, what's the fastest way that I can learn this material based on all the content that exists? Or you have a child and you're like, okay, well, how do I raise a healthy child? How do I learn all of the information? How do I download it? And we all have this dream, any of us that saw the matrix, right, of just plugging in and just downloading the information. And obviously that's science fiction. We can't do that until Elon or Brian Johnson succeeds in, you know, putting a, 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 an impl implant in every one of our brains. But before we get to that point, how do you learn all that material? Uh, how do you learn empathy? How do you learn how to engage with groups? How do you learn how to speak in public um, without doing it the old fashioned way? So AI agents that are democratized that help us with our education on a moment to moment basis towards what direction we want to pursue in general. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, also monitoring biometrics to know exactly how we feel in those states, all this type of stuff. Well, that's it, part it, of the reason I'm so excited about uh, IoT and 5G really starting to come out because as uh, uh, sensors become more ubiquitous and as uh, they achieve larger market penetration, as you have sensors in your, tele in your television and in your refrigerator and in your bed, and uh, as we have even more data, then we can... Uh, tweak the algorithms and become uh, more and more effective at being able to understand uh, how to optimize our lives. This is probably a good point then to insert, well, okay, out of all of these, you know, fourth industrial revolution technologies, it seems as though they're also enabling the potential for malevolence to come through more easily. So what do you think is evil and how do you think it can be avoided in the fourth industrial revolution? You know, that's a really good question. Right, and uh, at the end of the day, I'm not a philosopher and I'm, uh, I'm not a spiritual leader, so uh, take anything I say with a grain of salt or an entire uh, salt shaker fool. But I think evil is the intentional uh, causing of suffering or pain in another individual. Um, 
And we see people do this, right? They, they realize that their actions are going to cause pain in other people, but they make a calculation, I guess, in their mind that uh, the benefit that they sustain um, is worthwhile the pain that they cause to others. Um, and I don't know how to solve that. Uh, I think through education, potentially, you can teach children from a much younger age empathy and how to come to the spiritual realiza realization that we're all actually part of the same or super organism, that you and I are uh, different iterations of essentially the same being. Um, I mean, it's like this idea of if you had a blood cell, a red blood cell in your body that decided, hey, screw everybody else, I'm my own person, I'm not connected to any of the other tissue and just begins attacking everything else. Well, we have a name for that, we call that cancer. <laughs> but when humans do that, um, we sometimes have other names for it, whether it's selfishness or um, uh, or other things that I'm not going to say on the podcast. But do you um, do you feel like part of the disconnection from spirit or source, what sustains us, nature, the ecosystems on this planet? Do you feel like that um, disconnection has caused room for evil to be more prevalent? Well, potentially, um, I. I feel like, uh, and I'm not a historian, but from everything I've read, I think e evil has existed long before we moved from an agrarian society into an in industrial one and far before uh, we went online. Um, the challenge I think now is it's a lot more visible, uh, which um, causes people to focus on it more. And that could be good or bad, right? Uh, if you look at the, um, the data uh, from almost all metrics, the world is moving in a positive direction, right? There's fewer wars, there's fewer fatalities, there's fewer, there's less crime, there's less poverty, uh, there's uh, less infant mortality. Um, the world is actually going in a really good direction. It's, it's pretty incredible how far we've come in a short period of time. Now, with that being said, uh, because we're all interconnected and because of uh, the technological advancements that we've had, a few bad actors can have a much more profound effect on a large number of people. And so the, the power of people who perhaps lack a conscious, conscience or are sociopaths or um, are willing to perform evil acts on other people, they're more enabled to act in ways that um, are not, do not benefit humanity, but rather benefit a very small number of people. And we see that in the environment, right? There's a recent study that shows that there's about 100 people in the world that are causing 90% of global warming and the catastrophic climate change. And so, well, what do we do about that? Yeah, deep spiritual enlightenment about the ecosystems that sustain us and prevent um, the dynamics that enable people to pollute the environment which has no say in what people decide to do with with things and some t and self dealing tendencies, these things uh, I think of yeah evolving away from them. Of course, um, how about we go into simulation theory? Sure, absolutely. Do you think we're in a simulation? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's I don't know the answer, uh, but I think from a statistical uh, perspective, it's very highly likely that we're in a simulation. I mean, I don't need to go through. Uh, the statistics with you, I'm sure you and all your viewers already have seen it. What I will look at is from a scientific perspective, if you were creating a simulation where you wanted the AI in the simulation to not realize it's a simulation, what are some things you would do? And I think I, I stole this from maybe an XKCD comic or something, but you would essentially set the parameters of the physical environment such that they can't actually see the limits, right? You would create a universe that's expanding faster than the speed of light and then makes the speed of light an absolute uh, maximum speed. And so there's no way to actually see the edges of, uh, of the simulation, right? Um, and it's really interesting when you get into quantum mechanics and you look at the way that particles behave uh, at a subatomic level, whether they're particles or waves, and you probably know the, the Schrodinger's cat analogy. It's really fascinating that um, with all of the experiments that have been replicated in every country, um, if we're looking at a subatomic particle, it either behaves as a wave or a point, depending on whether we're looking at it or not. 
And the universe knows if we're looking at it. If we stop looking at it, it goes back to behaving as a wave, as a, a potentiality, right? Uh, but then the minute we look, it immediately solidifies. And so it's, that's fascinating to me. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't yeah, think any that, physicist alive does. That was the most intelligent answer I've heard on the show <laughs> regarding the simulation. It's a good one for sure. Thank you, Brian. Absolutely. And so where do you think that leads then with our, of course, yes, the hard to probe the edges of the simulation, uh, potentially purposely made so that way, but then we bake in our own simulations and observe those and mm -hmm. uh, all these types of things. And then also the, where do you think that goes with like life trajectories where, you know, all the possibility states exist for Brian's life and then you look one way and then you choose and collapse it, the direction of your life. Well, it's a, a really fascinating question that we can dive into the 11 dimensions, right, of uh, going beyond the first four, and uh, time being the fourth one, which we know is space that's um, slightly different in a different format. But once we get into the fifth and sixth dimension, it looks at all of the potential realities that all exist at the same time, right? Because we know from quantum mechanics, or at least from all the theories, string theory and so forth, that the future already exists, the past exists, and we're just going through this p dimension time that we don't control, just like a two-dimensional being living in a three-dimensional world uh, can observe the third dimension, they can measure the third dimension, but can never actually control the third dimension and, and travel within it, right? And so if we're looking at it from that lens, there's a future Brian that's a trash man, there's a future Brian that's a billionaire, there's a future Brian that is a saint, and there's a future Brian that's in prison. And so uh, all of those futures also exist simultaneously. The, the question is, this iteration of Brian, which future do I wind up experiencing and living? And there's other, itera other iterations that will experience the other ones. Um, and so, so that could be the parallel universes experiencing those. That's exactly yeah. right. And so then the question is all the decisions we make day to day. And it's generally, in my experience, I could be completely wrong. It's not one or two big decisions that create the trajectory of our lives. It's a series of small yeah decisions that we make continually over time yep. um, that wind up having an impact on which of these future potentials that we live into. And so we see them collapse as we look at them, as we pay attention to them into the one, the one future. And so that's a question I wake up with every day. Um, I ask myself, well, first of all, I start by um, uh, journaling my gratitude because I found that to be very useful for me yeah. to think about all the things I'm grateful for. But then I think about, um, and I have a, a painting of myself that we did through Hero Glass that represents the idealized version of me that created by an AI for 20 years from now. So I can look at it and say, okay, that Brian that has already lived into this reality, what decisions would he make today? What is he doing to leave the world in a better place than I found it? And so I think that's a question that at times in my life when I haven't asked and I've gone into that just that rote life, the habit patterns that we, we create, sometimes you forget about that and just get lost into the day to day. And I wake up and it feels like six months later, it's like, holy cow, what did I actually do over the past six months? Did I do anything to make the world a better place? Or did I just stack some cash and do some work that didn't really matter? Um, and so I, I try and I'm not perfect at it. Um, but uh, one of the things that I focus on is trying to, uh, to make that at the forefront of my mind every morning. Yeah, yeah, and that's what you do with Hero Glass, again, links in the bio, um, is, again, this ideal self. When you future author yourself in this state of achieving your North Star and you know your incremental steps that you need to get there, this type of thing, that can really launch someone off um, versus uh, not knowing, not journaling, not having gratitude, not this type of stuff. So it's just completely different like tra life trajectories with even simple things like that. What do you think happens before birth and after death? That's a really good question, right? So that's a, a question of, at the end of the day, um, uh, is our consciousness um, a local or, or a non-local phenomenon? Um, so I think every philosopher has, has asked this question of, um, is our consciousness a, a function of our brain and our biome, or is this body just a vehicle for a consciousness that exists beyond space and time or beyond our life cycle? Um, 
So I would look at this in two ways. So um, one thing I would say is I used to be an atheist, and after coming across simulation hypothesis and really diving into it, and I realized I can't be an atheist, and I moved to agnostic because uh, mm -hmm. I there could be a this could all be a seventh grade homework assignment uh, where the the kid got a C, right? Um, that's just as possible as the God hypothesis and everything else. But if we're looking at uh, consciousness. Um, all of the evidence that I've seen, or I, uh, maybe I should say, I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that our consciousness is non-local um, or that our consciousness exists after we die. Um, I am open to being proven wrong. Um, Do you ever my, feel like it's all consciousness? My, I, I think it's a function of, I, mean, I personally believe that many animals are conscious, that we just don't know it because they have no way of communicating those ideas to us, right? Um, my working hypothesis on this is that our consciousness is uh, actually quite primitive compared to what it can be um, because so much of our behavior is actually just operant conditioning and classical conditioning. Um, so much of the behavior that we have, so much of the ways that we think about life, we think that we have free will, but really we're just following a path based on all the experiences that we've had, all the interactions we've had with people, all the books that we've read that have uh, molded our realities. And so the question then in my mind is, if I had been born in your body and I had lived through all your experiences, would I behave in the exact same way as you? And I think there's a certain fatalism to that, but at the same time, I think it's likely. Um, but then the, that brings up the question of what happens when we download our brain into a robot. So, or if we uh, download our brain into another body. Uh, for example, on a, Ray Kurzweil famously wants to download his brain into a computer and so forth. Uh, so is that a transference of memories? Is that what makes us who we are? Is it a transference of the actual, let's say, soul or consciousness? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I suspect that it's, it's local. And then what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful thing in the world... Um, other than you, of course, I oh. think <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's um, joy, pure, unbridled joy. Um, when you see a person that's just overcome with that happiness that they can't contain, it's uh, I think an incredibly beautiful thing. Yeah, mm. that's a good one. Yeah, makes me feel. Warm, happy. Makes me reminds me of the ride back up from the last weekend with Mama. I was really excited. Yeah. Yeah, I was really excited. Yeah, yeah. Those moments are so precious. Yeah. And to be able to help make them more available for all humans. Again, I think it has so much to do with just our connection to nature that can bring us that joy. Yeah. 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 In the film we watched today, The Twelve, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was amazing. And I mean, I think it, it, you're absolutely right. I think nature plays a really large role in being connected to the world. I think part of it too is, um, at least for me, when I'm engaged with something that I fully deeply believe in, that's completely aligned with my values and my life, and I feel like I'm having an impact, and I don't know what it's like for other people, but I suspect there's some elements that, that are the same, that when you feel like you're doing the right thing, that you're... Uh, you're going after your calling I feel like that can create that joy for you as yeah. well at least it does for me where um, it ceases to be about the material possessions and you lose yourself in the work because it just yeah. brings you this feeling of true fulfillment yes yes <laughs> again just makes me feel so happy and every human deserves exactly that pursuing their north star with full vigor yeah yeah full joy along the way brian thank you very much for coming on the show thank you for having me this has been an amazing conversation thank you yeah Absolutely. i've had a lot of fun yeah, thanks for coming too. on and teaching us about all this it's been a blast Thank you to everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Also check out the links in the bio below. Again, that's ahuraai.com. Also heroglass.org and all of the social profiles for Brian. Check those out, everyone. 
And also go and share more content around AI and education. Have more conversations with your family, your friends, coworkers, people online on social media about things like the SDGs, about the fourth industrial revolution, about the ways to minimize inequality in the future, all these types of things. And shout out to Ron Vargas for producing and directing. Thank you very much, Ronnie. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support them, help them grow, support simulation. Our links are below Patreon, cryptocurrency, and PayPal. Support us. And if you want to design merch and get paid, that link is below as well. Go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Peace.